Now that's absolutely hilarious. Are you telling me a, a panel of 30 people <laughs> can leave a game? Now I'll admit maybe half time, right? There is another yeah. half of football, so there's no talk about it at half time. If you're telling me they didn't do a blow by blow analysis of that row <laughs> on the bus on the way home, it's, that was the one I thought was the most outrageous um, to think. But again, what's he going to do? Give people a list of names? <laughs> Yet. It took me a long time to get here. Both parents have, have spoken with each other. So we missed this on Monday, lads. Desi Farrell was talking about. Do you remember me, Conan? Connor's, Connor's here as well. Do you remember me speculating that the they were the, the game in Oma hardly went ahead because the TV made them go ahead? Well, Desi Farrell thinks that that was the case because he said that a GA official said to me that only for the TV being there, the game would not go ahead. So straight away I read that and went, damn, I wish I had that for the show now and not have to speculate about it. But the GEA have denied that. Fergal McGill told the Irish Sun, said the, uh, Fergal McGill said, the decision to play the game had nothing to do with TV. In no way would it be a case where TV dictates whether a game goes ahead or not. Yeah. Isn't that a weird situation where Desi Farrell, who we're not, I'm not going to disbelieve Desi Farrell, who was told something. But what's a GEA official? Do you know what yeah. I mean? What does that mean? Is that somebody standing up behind his jacket just in Tyrone? And all TV making us go ahead? Or like, I don't know. It reminded me of Mickey Hart saying Sky made them put the lines in. <laughs> just think of that in a second, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I actually got in touch with RT this morning. I was like, what's the story? Why, why are you making them play the game? <laughs> <laughs> and he just said, RT had no input whatsoever into any decision. That it was air as well. Yeah. Air, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, well, it was air as well. But it, it, maybe there was an extra pressure to, f- from the referee to make it. Look, the referee should be completely independent of what happens yeah. on... On, on remember I joked that the referee would get this phone call from Crow Park <laughs> the game goes ahead and then he just puts down the phone because he was going out throwing balls on the ground or just sticking in the water yeah. so everyone just thought it was a bizarre and th- this is even more bizarre that Desi Farrell would say that and the GA completely deny it you just don't know what to believe here yeah but did, did they lose the or do your air lose the rights to show the game entirely I know Mayo Kerry was meant to be on on Saturday as well and because that was moved to Sunday they could th- that wasn't live because TG Carr would have had their games on Sunday as well and there would have been a conflict yeah, of interest there neither so. Air nor RT would have had any game that weekend yeah. there had to be a pressure there lads I think so Do you know, yeah. I, I would believe there was a pressure there we don't know how that a pressure was applied or <laughs> yeah, wh- wh- yeah. how it happened but anyways Brian Howard's been talking during the week lads and this is funny so um, Brian Howard uh, number one it's a bit of a weird one that Brian Howard did some media I'm raging I missed it because I like to talk to Brian and now our ban is lifted that can just talk to them. I didn't see that email and I'm a bit annoyed about that. But anyways, I'm surprised Brian Howard was doing media on the Tuesday after Big Brawl, number one, because I reckon Jim Gavin might have told yeah. him, here, buddy, you're not doing that this week. You're not going mm-hmm. to answer questions. Anyways, but he did it. And sure, he just, you know, he played the game like any player is going to play the game. And he says, I was actually off the pitch. So I was in the dressing room uh, at the time. He says, I heard a bit of commotion, but I was genuinely in the dressing room. Like, there's pictures of him... Mm. <laughs> like watching the fight right <laughs> so that's funny I think that's funny this is like Arsene Wenger I did not I didn't see the incident I'm not going to stop even trying to do any impression but like I mean that's it what's he going to say he's not going to say well I witnessed it all but I can't tell you you know what I mean so he's just completely brushing off that question which is fair enough um, then another one I thought was even funnier he says when they came in at half time we had another half to go out and try to win the game so we weren't talking about it then after the game there was no chat about it. it it was just what we did wrong and what we want to put right in two weeks now that's absolutely hilarious are you telling me a, a panel of 30 people <laughs> can leave a game now I'll admit maybe half time right there is another yeah. half of football so there's no talk about it at half time if you're telling me they didn't do a blow by blow analysis of that row <laughs> on the bus on the way home it's, that was the one I thought was the most outrageous um, to think but again what's he going to do give people a list of names are people really annoyed that a player wouldn't throw his teammates under the bus that were having a bit of a shamozzle in a tunnel <laughs> would have been great if he said yeah I was there or lads gave as good as they got yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. And started listing a few names now well he's a little bit upset about it he, yeah. could, he could face a six month ban <laughs> should see the head on Scully there he got a right on the yeah, well, we, the job Hamsey got a good few slaps yeah. now off X no I think the GA need to come in and, and hammer both of us now and deal with this correctly <laughs> yeah. madness madness so that's it Brian Howard did the right thing he's just listen he's just playing the game um, for his teammates and that's it it was um, actually confirmed since Monday that Porrick Hamsey was shown the black card for allegedly verbally abusing an opponent as the teams left the field so m- that maybe is how it all kicked off like I mean if Hamsey 
said something. We're wondering how this kicked off because the game was played in such good spirits. He got the black card and apparently the black card was for verbal abuse. Obviously, some Dublin player took exception to this and went at it down the tunnel. If he'd known Hamsey was a boxer, he might not. Mm. Might, that <laughs> might not. I, I'd heard that, that Hamsey was... Is a Hamsey Irish bo- boxed at a very, very high level anyway? Have you heard that? You were looking at me a bit weird. Yeah. Conan, but he has anyway. He's not to be messed with. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few of the Dublin that's not to be messed with as well, to be fair. I'm just thinking there's a lot of black cards that haven't been handed that out over the last few years I, I'd know. forgotten that it was a yeah. offense, like a verbal abuse was an offence yeah but. it's very rarely implemented yeah. the verbal abuse one so me go back down lads um, and I thought it was an interesting stat that before this year five of the last eight teams that have been promoted to the top flight have gone straight back down um, and the other three just lasted stayed up the first year and then went down the second year so like I mean it's very obvious to me that there's a top six in the country isn't that fair enough that there's a top six and there's actually a decent gap to the Kildare and the Roscommons and the Cavans and the ones trying and the Meads and the ones trying to get into that top six and we know who the top six are they're the top six in the league at the moment right well no Mayo or Mayo are in well, it who's, yeah. who's jumped into Mayo's position but you get my point Donegal I think have been kind of up and down the last couple of years as well yeah, yeah, well, maybe there's a top maybe there's a top seven then no there's yeah. a top seven yeah. yeah there's a top seven and um yeah, that then there's a one. Mead Raw was guaranteed to go down, and the qu- the question is who was going to well, go there's, down. There's a top two, and then there's there's four after that, and then there's one that's that's threatening to get into the second top four, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, like Donegal are probably the only uh, good like, good team that have gone up and down. Probably in that list of figures. That you but gave I'd have there. Donegal well up. It. I'd have Same Donegal course, well up yeah. there. I wouldn't have them in any team. You, you you're looking at Kerry Dublin, obviously. Yeah. Then you're looking at Galway, Tyrone, Donegal. And Mon- then give I'm us Mayo as well. Monaghan, Mayo, Monaghan, oh, sorry, Mayo, yeah. Mayo. Then I'm looking at Monaghan slightly off that, but uh, you know, because uh, let's let's be honest, Monaghan are, Monaghan are a great, having a great league. They always have a great league mm. because they're honest and they hit that league hard. I would still wait to see what Monaghan do this summer. You know what I mean? I still see Monaghan above Kildare, Mead, and Cavan and these teams, but a little bit below Donegal, Tyrone, uh, Mayo, and. Galway <laughs> <laughs> Let's not revisit that You left Galway either. until last I can't yeah, believe yeah, it Yeah 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 But Galway are knocking on the door Of the top two Listen anyway This is a pointless kind of conversation <laughs> This is almost like Power rankings Who's you're talking about <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah like, like Donegal Got relegated two years ago And then they won Ulster And then they were Division 2 last year And won Ulster So sometimes yeah We talk about it every year The league isn't always a great metric But yeah. from me's point of view Like they, they were obviously In the Super 8s last year So you're thinking right Are they going to push you on there They're in Division 1 they got hammered all the games in Super 8s and now they've they've lost five matches in a row. So that's eight games in a row that they've lost, really. But yeah. the last three, they've obviously they've been one-score games. So maybe they're getting a bit better, but it's, it's too late. <laughs> they're well, relegated. Donald Cogan said that to you, didn't he? Like last week, that like while I think you mentioned about momentum, when you're constantly, when you're constantly losing games, it's hard to arrest that to get back to winning. But I think he said it, he's obviously going to say it, but I think, he, I think these teams are genuinely going to benefit from playing against the top teams all the time and then lose and learning as you go, yeah. as opposed to bit them being in Division 2, maybe getting promoted and just not kind of not playing at the same level that they're playing Division 1 at the Super 8s. And then, like, they're relegated now, but if you look at Mead in the Championship then, I think they have to beat, if they beat Kildare in a semi-final, they're probably going to get there. They're through to a Leinster final with Dublin. Good chance to get into the Super 8s again. So it might look great for them that they're going down, but, like, I'd say they're on an upper curve and if you look at it, if Andy McEntee is looking at it from an overall point of view, I think he'd be happy enough with where they're where they're going at least. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't act it. I would I would agree with you. And I think that when West Mead go back playing or when Mead go back playing division two teams now, they will find it a lot easier than mm. they did because they've played at the top level. That's obvious. But Andy McIntyre's never happy. He's always given out. <laughs> and Mal- Maliki Clerken had a brilliant tweet, I thought, last Sunday. I should have read it out. I didn't have time to talk about Mead. And he says if Andy McIntyre isn't given out to the ref as he walks off off, can it truly be said to be half time like I mean he's constantly attacking referees it's yeah. all their fault like every game and sometimes you sometimes you feel you feel sorry for managers doing media when they're on a run of losing because what do you keep like what do you mm-hmm. always have to say and can you keep making excuses but I don't think he's in Division 1 no one's expecting him to do anything you can they're actually performing relatively well they should have beaten Mayo they performed great against Galway at home do you know, like, I mean, this is not an embarrassing, they have no points, but it's not an embarrassing, um, yeah. um, you know, run in Division 1 by any means, considering 
the 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 injuries they've had. Like Mickey Newman, their best forward, like their goalkeeper is out, and they're down to their third choice goalkeeper. You know, Young Conlon only came back the last day. Shane Walsh up front was out. You know, the Haran, the centre oh, back Harnan, was out. Yeah. yeah, Harnan. Like I mean, you're talking about Lavin, the cornerback, guaranteed starter. I think he could have got nominated for an All Star. Mm. These are some serious mix of players that these can't afford to be without so they've done well but he's just constantly whinging about about uh, referees and giving out and getting stressed out relax <laughs> Andy yeah. relax you've done well I wouldn't be too worried you get everybody back and well them and Kildare is going to be a great game yeah and I, it's sort of it's almost wears thin a little bit because all the headlines are always Andy McIntyre blasts referee yeah and, and on the line he's losing his marbles yeah, yeah and like, there's a lot of decisions they were, actually they were great against Kerry as well away they lost yeah. by three away to Kerry like yeah lost by one before that to Mayo should, should have, have beaten, beaten them yeah. like you know so they are, they're going alright and like sometimes a decision does screw you over but I, I read his quotes from the last game and it was, he was talking about for kickouts they were being held and you know, men were being pushed off yeah. the ball. It's like, oh, like, like that's man how up some and yeah. yeah, that's yeah. how man some referees it's referee. A big, it's a big like, bad yeah. world out there. And I, I saw Parry Joyce saying like that. That was the same for both teams. Like you know, that that's how he was refereeing it. It wasn't a penalty decision that he missed. Or yeah, something. yeah. I think because Galway, Mead were playing brilliantly, and then Galway got back into it just before half time And Andy thought it was true cynical means or true you know refereeing decisions and whatever and he's losing his head about this and listen like I don't think he needs to go down that road and like genuinely anyone looking at Mead they haven't done they haven't been wiped out you know they've they've performed admirably and if anything with half a team they've they've you know done better than expectations because I thought they could have seen you know with half a team meet in Division mm-hmm. 1 you would think they're in big big trouble you know and yeah. it's only the Donegal game really was an embarrassing performance and I like that Donald Kogan admitted that giving in a good ball and recycling it back out is something they're actively working on because it's an obvious thing in the Donegal game yeah. which was awful and then you have to think again they're nowhere near their first t- choice forward line do you know mm. what I mean? Some of their first choice forwards might go at it in that. So maybe you're, again, you're being hard. We're being hard on a team that's not at that level with half a bloody team. Yeah, yeah. But the more the more Andy McEntee like gives out about the ref all the time, the more headlines that's yeah. going to command, as you say. So the less kind of uh, the less the, 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 there's, there's going to be not as much encouraging chat about me. Whereas you know, as you said, it, it hasn't been that bad of a campaign at all. And when the just the complaints that Andy McEntee might have are justified as they were with the Mayo game when he should like yeah, injury time was blown up bang on four minutes when there should have been more you've less sympathy because oh, gosh, you're giving out about the referee again like you know so <laughs> I, I don't know like he's it's it, as you said it's hard when, when somebody is interviewed immediately after the game but um, I don't know maybe something Andy McEntee might learn from going forward to you know because the focus will be more on the positive things they're doing then if, 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 if he's not always kind of giving out about that Yeah no exactly so the back pass rule has had a mixed reaction um, Desi Farrell thinks it's a good rule change. He said, "I actually think it's a good rule change. It's squeezing the thing up because you can see there, um, you can see out there in situations where teams want to run down the clock, they've got their advantage, and the use of the goalkeeper be- uh, becomes quite apparent in that way. It just makes it more interesting, and that's a point of it we didn't really talk about. We talked a lot about from the kickouts, but it is for winding down the clock as well. If you want to pass it over and back." you do they have that option. But then again, that's not going to stop that. It's just from a kick out, isn't it? Yeah. Just from a kick out, they could kick it out, give it back, then yeah. play a bit of keep ball. Again, it is a high risk strategy, <laughs> especially we saw Kerry couldn't do it against Dublin in the all Ireland final, but it is another thing he's talking about. Porrick Joyce, delighted, brilliant, great news, genuinely, yeah. We know how much do you love Porrick Joyce? <laughs> and then he says, I'm te- this is another brilliant Porrick Joyce quote. I'm telling our lads since I came in, no back passing. So that's another they're not allowed to do. It's great. Now, According to Kieran Dealey's website, uh, Galway are the worst culprits at given yeah. to the goalkeeper and given or a short kick out and giving it back. But you know, th- stats can tell a lot of stuff. Would you say they well. do it seventy percent of the time after last week? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. Like, what what did they have it down at thirty percent? Twenty six or something, or something like but that. But I, I do think that. At the same time, that's 26 of all. Yeah. You, you, was it you that made that point to me or did someone else make that point on Twitter? That's 26% of all hand passing and kick passing. I'm talking about their directness yes, from an yes, attack. Yeah, yeah, that was it. You know, which I still hold, stand by my 70. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me on this show, yeah. as my stats are very, very rarely <laughs> wrong because someone, no one will be, everyone will be too lazy to disprove it. <laughs> Porrick Joyce has you wrapped around his little finger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he does. He does. Um, for a bit of balance here, because we love balance on this show, absolutely don't. Um, Niall Morgan, who is really annoyed about it, 
he says, for me, I don't understand why people who don't play the game get to make decisions on what players have to do. To me, goalkeeping has changed vastly in the last 10 or 12 years with Cluxton coming along, then myself, Rory, Rory Began, Graham Brody, Sean Patton as well. We're all trying to make goalkeepers want to play. I thought that was a really nice line. We're all trying to make goalkeepers want to play. You know, because let's be honest, when we all grew up, nobody's putting their hand up to say, I want to be a goalie. Whereas now, potentially, it is a much more attractive position on the field to play in Mm. the way these lads play the goalkeeping game. Yeah, the the only thing I'd say about Niall Morgan's tweet there, like I actually agree, I just thought the rule was unnecessary. Thought there's a lot of like interference from the football review committee over the last few years, but this rule came through a club in Kildare. Yeah, you know, so it was brought through like that, and probably by players potentially. No, you know. this was Stephen O'Mara that came up with this one because remember Joe Brawley tried to claim it back then, and I was saying Brawley's actually claiming something because he. Rem- I remember him replying to Stephen O'Mara's article saying "well done" no. and then claimed it on his own. Yeah, but Stephen O'Mara didn't get into Congress. I mean, like how he, it was actually voted on and stuff. Yeah, like but actually. but the point I'm making is it's not. It's just not people who have never played the game thinks this is a good idea. Like Brawley thinks a good idea, Stephen O'Mara thinks a good That's idea. That's what I'm saying. Like, mm. and, and it was a club. It wasn't like as people sometimes think the the GA committees are just a, a bunch of grey haired people who are out of touch. This came through the proper democratic system, uh, if you will, and then it was voted on. I still think we have enough rule changes. We have lots of tweaks, contrary to what some people think. Like you know. I didn't think it was that necessary, but I'm not going to cry about it. Yeah, well, look, to be honest, I don't think it'll change the game that much at all. <clears throat> it's just not going to... And and listen, anyone that would say a goalkeeper should stay on his line and not come out, that's really old-fashioned. What I don't like is the idea that this is going to complete... That goalkeepers can't come out now mm. because of this. They yeah. can. And yeah. they can play flamboyant football. They can get out and get involved, get up the field. They just can't take a return pass from a kick out because they want to reward the team that's pressing up on the six backs for me I, I don't yeah, they can be the third pass you know yeah, if, they, if the, rece- yeah, if the exactly. receiver of the kick out gives the ball to somebody else then the goalkeeper can come on to it absolutely and like the only like not, the only time that Niall Morgan has come off the pitch in, in recent years hasn't been just as a result of a 1-2 do you know no. like he's gotten he's got involved at other times now I know that's probably the most the easiest and most direct route to get involved but that's not the only way the goalkeepers can get involved and like what's evolved in recent years as well through maybe not Morgan but definitely Cluxton definitely Graham Brody definitely even there was a famous incident in a Mayo under 20 game when the keeper acted as an extra defender or a sweeper and teams when they have to go ultra aggressive are doing that as well where a goalkeeper might actually mark somebody for it so it's like I can I can maybe see where he's coming from in terms of like I know the rule wasn't rushed through but there was nearly that kind of sentiment last week especially like we're leading up to a congress where the black card was the talk of the week about hurling you know so there was so much coverage of it whereas the kind of you know the the, the pack bass rule seemed to kind of just be yeah. go through unnoticed and all of a sudden we're going to be doing it in a month's time as opposed to trial period and, and, and next year and, and we know that the the kickouts a lot of the time they can still go short because the press is impossible all the time the game's so disorganised the goalie can be fast enough just to get it out restarted through a corner back the only time this comes into into play is when a press comes on how many times can you get a good aggressive press and then when you have a good aggressive press on you have to have the opportunity to give it to the corner back and to get it back where a lot of time when there's a good aggressive press the right thing to do is drive it out I'm not sure this will re. It's going to make a terrible amount of difference in no. the actual game. You know, I I think we, it'll be a bit like the midfield mark. It'll just continue on without really being noticed. You know, and it won't discourage Niall Morgan. You would take a lot of rule changes to discourage Niall Morgan, Graham Brody, and these lads not to come out of the goals. That's <laughs> yeah. what, that's the that's the Gaelic football they love. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a rule in five a side. Like that, you can't if, if the keeper kicks it out, you can't give it back to him. You have to Is pass it? it to somebody else. Yeah, because otherwise, if you're winning, you could just keep giving it back to the keeper inside the area, and the players couldn't. Tackle. Oh, so yeah. if you make a pass in outfield player then you can play it back right well there um, you go look if it works in five a side <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about elite level <laughs> five a side here, here yeah. acid test um, Davy Fitzgerald lads um, I was going to ask Cheddar about this on the on the football show or on the hurling show but I was talking might as well throw it to you now because I think it, it is kind of interesting and you know I was asking Davy about it last um, last week when I was talking to him and the big thing about Davy is that he doesn't give big rousing team talks anymore and he says in the dressing room maybe 10 seconds that's it we have other things we do but we'll keep that to ourselves but there's other things we do I feel is more beneficial to what we do in the field I can't believe anything I don't believe anything you do on the day of a game will change the player too much I believe that the week the 10 days before it is the window this is for team talks now like I said to Davy last week Davy 
would get you traditionally Davy would be well able to make one of these bang on the tables you've seen it on YouTube mm. like I mean loads of expletives thrown in and that would get lads going he doesn't do it you know like I mean the day of that rousing speech I think at club level it might take a while to die out but I think at inter-county level Jim Gavin absolutely could you imagine him raising his, raising his voice I reckon they're more processed based um, Davy Fitz has given it up I think the day the day of the ability to rally your team up 10 minutes before the game I don't know is, is that needed for a championship match especially <clears throat> if Davy Fitz has given it up then <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, then, yeah. then I think it might as well be obsolete um, yeah that, that, it's a very professional mindset I mean like all these inter-county teams they've all their work done in the couple of weeks beforehand I'd like the limit they have a more limited time frame in the league but definitely in championship it's it's not a case that they they know their jobs you know, well, well before, a couple yeah. of days before, they probably have a meeting the night before just to kind of run through them again. So as you said, the days of them kind of bashing the table and stuff is probably gone. And actually, like you hear a lot of stories about that it being player led now, especially at half time. I think this could have been a thing under Dublin where Jim Gavin would leave the players on their own for a couple of minutes. And yeah. this is to kind of, this is more at half time to work out problems that had, you know, arisen during the first half. But, but yeah, it's um, it's something you would have heard kind of coming from professional sports, like even like going back to the famous one with Paul O'Connell putting the fear of God into you. I doubt that happens in the Irish rugby dressing room now. I think that's gradually evolved into into GAA. But like, well, then Drico came and says we will be victorious. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. But I, I I'd say there's still some scope for the like um. You know, we've we've talked about it before when when you notice that your team is a bit flat. Now you'd like to think that like intercounty players have gone beyond that, but definitely at club level. Yeah. You know, like I I I don't think it's gonna I don't think it's gonna go at club level for a long time because there will be those situations where managers will just see that their team is in need of something. It mightn't work because they might be flat anyway, regardless of but what it, you say. To see, them, this is the thing, and this is what I think is interesting about Davy that if the work is done in the ten we in the ten days leading up, the week, the Friday night before the game, the players should be arriving here. Let's tuned in. Like what is what is said? I'm talking about championship. I do agree that in a league game, if they land and they're messing and mm. stuff like that, um, you know, you could hop off them. But for championship, geez, I I remember with with manager. I don't think anything any managers ever said in the dressing room made me change my 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 uh, my attitude. But I do remember meetings on a Friday night that changed my attitude that made me really tune in all day Saturday and land to that game with my gear perfect and we're on a mission today. You know, that kind yeah. of... That needs to happen during the week. You need to be really tuned in all week for a big championship game. But can you not be tuned in and then on the game suddenly, oh, this is... You know, I, I don't... I, I think you waste energy shouting and roaring. I think you can be distracted by numerous team talks. The warm-up someone's talking the dressing room someone's talking the huddle before the game someone's talking the same old shite stay tight in your manner you're, you're wasting your energy like you're tuned into that you go through what everybody's job is you, the, the motivation should speak for itself for championship you know what I mean I think the, the, the idea that you're constantly I remember before the Leinster final against Dublin it was crazy stuff what was going on in the leash dressing room like Sean Dempsey who's a great man um, managed the Leash Miners to Minor All Ireland, and he's managed for Ban last year, and he was with the Leash Seniors manager. But his idea with these lads, he'd, he'd give you a puck or two. Like I remember writing on this on Sports Show, and we're in a huddle, and he would have had Brendan Quigley and My, M. John, Michael John Tierney and all these lads at under his, and he's walking around in the huddle, and he's giving lads punches into the chest, and Brendan Quigley going, <laughs> and he's like he's gone into another another place, yeah. and I'm just constantly thinking like I'm I'm going along with the, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm watching her, I'm watching them see like a hawk, and I says if this lad hits me, I'm I don't want to be hit. Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about this game. Can I step out of this <laughs> huddle? I, I'm, I'm well up yeah. for this game. It's double in the Leinster final in Croke Park did we need that there was a table broken in, in the dressing room as we walked out and it was real raw kind of now we started the game brilliantly so it's a bizarre kind of t- it's a bizarre thing that what I was believing in and I definitely think I expended energy by getting involved in this rah, but that as a shelf how long was that effective for did you have a good 20 minutes we had a good, and we had a good 20 minutes but, do you know what I mean but think uh, how long though in between from that shouting and stuff I always wonder as a crew park especially like the big game so you have this roaring shout and you break a table yeah. then you come out and you're doing a parade you're doing yeah. a few more kicking around you're and standing you for around. a national anthem and then the worst thing is one more effort to get you up just in the huddle yeah. I say Christ what can be said here that's new <laughs> yeah. and it's a player that says it and they all do it 
And it's like, oh, that's a bit of a waste of time. Do you know? Like, I, I, I don't know. It, it's definitely moved away. I, I can't see that they at inter-county level where they're banging on t- now I reckon Banty McAnini might do it you I know it depends I suppose on the manager I think there could be something to be said for it at half time still I, I think there's just you're right like your preparation should be right 10 days before like especially a couple of days before um, and there's too long a gap between the changing room and the start of the match to have a uh, direct effect but at half time you just come in you've yeah. seen something you're not happy with something yeah you can probably tap into the uh, emotional senses of players a bit yeah. more. Well, Joe Kernan's obvious one in the All Ireland final in 2002 yeah. was he showed the medal. The but medal, I, w- yeah. I doubt Joe was shouting and roaring then. I'd say he very, very calmly said, lads, this is what you're playing for. Mm. Do you want this medal like me, a runners up one, or do you want to be winners? And a natural kind of roar would come after that and get out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's nice to go out after a come on and yeah. get out the door. Yeah, you know, yeah, it puts yeah. an end to all the. the <laughs> it's almost like it puts a finality to half time. Yeah. <laughs> Like you can't Let's not go out without Are we ready? Yeah <laughs> wonder does anyone do The Alex Ferguson thing Lads it's a leash Get out there <laughs> <laughs> Who did you say that about Spurs wasn't it? Tottenham yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay um, moving on from that Oshin Mullen um, Some bad news for you uh, Connor. Mm. Um, he's one of four players That's getting AFL trials During April So they're going on A two week trial In Australia and uh, I think they go around to a few different clubs. This is another different one again. Like we know there's the combine. So obviously from the combine, <coughs> th- this results from the combine. And then you, I didn't know, I thought, a pl- I thought you were signed to a club from the combine. This is just heading around to a few different clubs and doing yeah. a trial with them. Two players, I think last year that did this tour. I, like I don't know, is it four players that are going in total this year? But I think two players that went on this tour last stayed year was, were signed up or, or stayed out. So look, James Horn was asked directly about this in an interview last week and uh, all he said was that he was confident that Oshie Mullen would be around for championship. So right. he sounded like a man that is if not resigned to losing Oshin Mullen is resigned to the possibility that it might happen Do you know and I, like I know at the combine for what it's worth he did uh, the 20 metre sprint in 2.8 seconds which would have been level with the best in Australia I think in 2019 and some agility tests which wasn't far off the best in Australia last year as well which only confirms that what we already knew about Oshin Mullen anyways that he's really athletic rangy and yeah obviously concerned because like I went from thinking that um, there's a chance that Oshin Mullen might be involved in some capacity this year to after the few league games thinking that he's a guaranteed starter this year and apparently did very well on David Clifford and I suppose the worrying thing for Mayo is that like the the old guard are getting on and there's there's not a raft of young players kind of coming in to replace them and Oshin Mullen was maybe the, the poster boy for the next batch of Mayo players coming up so there is a possibility that come this time next year he could be gone so selfishly I don't want him to but like I'm not going to begrudge him you know, the yeah. prospect well, of making a career in the AFL. To either. be honest, it's always the same thing. You don't begrudge them, but like, I mean, it is a, you think James might, well, I suppose it's too late, I suppose, for him to get signed up now. If he's doing a trial in April, it wouldn't be for yeah. this year. So maybe James is like, we'll definitely have him this year if he's not ruling that out, but there's yeah. a chance he could be gone the following year. Maybe, I think so, something. yeah. I just wonder, is there any company in Tyrone that's willing to give him a job? <laughs> <laughs> it is funny. Yeah. Like I started maybe Tim O'Leary will <laughs> give him a job <laughs> in his hedge fund company or something. He could be a seller. I started looking through Buy the names. sell high. I know what to do. <laughs> All I'm doing is looking at the counties, you see, and when I don't see Derry, I'm like, ah, oh, grand, it's fine. Yeah. You're just shitting yourself that you're going to lose the players. So everyone yeah. becomes selfish. It's two for me. Oh, yeah. Frank Irwin as well. Is he so. good? I was reading about him. He was a star of the minors All or I saw was the couple of performances in the under-17 last year. He's good pedigree. He's the son of um, Gabriel Irwin, who was the Mayo keeper for years. Midfield, like midfield half forward direction, really athletic, really rangy. Still doing his leaving cert. So all I can go on is what I saw for the Mayo under 70s last year. He was really good. Um, so yeah, it could be not only one, but it could be a double hammer blow for, for Mayo if that happens. Yeah, exactly. These are big hitters. Two big games, obviously, this weekend. We're going to talk to Ryan McCluskey in very soon about Fermanagh and our man. Maybe we'll have a little bit of a chat when we finish talk when I finish talking to him. The other big game this weekend is Leash Dublin in the Leinster final. So Leash have done brilliantly to get back into another Leinster under twenty final. Um, again this year of course to meet Dublin who you know have been on another level to the other teams in Leinster um, well last year anyways and they were beaten in the final and they're back again this year but Ronan Coffey is the leash captain he's from Port Arlington he had an interview in leash today I thought it was, I thought it was interesting in that it was a little bit funny just the mindset that they that they had especially last year he says this year we're a little bit wiser as nine of us played in the final well I think just one of the current Dublin team was involved we came in last year and we had won every game I didn't think we were going to hammer them, but we thought we were going to beat them. <laughs> like they, they ended up losing by 13 points. And like he's trying to say, like, now we didn't think we were going to hammer them last year, but we, we, we all thought we were going to beat them. But they have nine left um, from last year's team, which is 
you know, like, I mean, it's a huge turnover and they were a very young team last year. So we give him a good chance and Dublin have a, a much bigger turnover. I'm not sure if he's right that they've only one left. Kieran Archer, obviously, unfortunately, from Leash is still on yeah. the go for Dublin. He scored 3-8 in last year's final, 2-1 from play. And he's still going uh, strong. So if he's the only one that's turned over, that's bad luck. <laughs> that's bad luck from a Leash point of view. Like Dublin have a few players who would have been involved in the squad obviously last year and like Evan Caulfield the midfielder got three points in the semi-final like he's just free scoring from there and he would have been involved in the squad the two half forwards would have been inv- they came on in the Leicester final last right. year against the Leash so yeah. they have a bit of experience there and part of me as well also just thinks ah, like it doesn't matter Dublin have just done it right they've got the oldest players each age group and now it's like a whole new team that Leash are playing yeah well could Dublin have the numbers to be able to do that yeah. Leash don't and like I mean you can't say to a Leash player okay you've, you've, next year you're good enough but we're just going you know yeah. Dublin have a, enough good lads under last year or whatever but still you, usually you have especially at under 20 I played three years at under 20 like Bino played five like, I mean, it's crazy he five years at under nah, he would have yeah he would have played five yeah I would I <laughs> You would have uh, under twenty ones. Chris back Conway then. under twenty ones back then. Yeah, if you were playing under twenty one when you were still minor, you were you would have been playing. Five. You have three after it. I'm pr- fairly sure Bino played five. And then uh, another interesting stat is that Eddie Kinsla is the Leash under twenty manager. Eddie Kinsla refereed the two thousand and fourteen All Ireland uh, final. Who is it between? Quick, I'm throwing it at you. One, Donegal, two, three, Terry. four. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know what you were about. <laughs> I actually missed a year. Uh, well, you stop, asked, will you? Yeah. you? Listen, you don't even know who played in the 14 hour <laughs> final, Conor Lewison. Kerry Donegal. <laughs> okay, so he's referee in that final. Um, he's obviously he was an inter county referee for a long time, but he was manager of Courtwood, who won the intermediate championship in Leash two years ago and stayed up at senior last year so interesting isn't it that a yeah. referee has mm. gone from refereeing uh, an inter-county referee has gone from refereeing to coaching I'd like to send him back refereeing now armed with all the coaching expertise and yeah. stuff that he has did he have a uh, yet to retire did he have two cruciates did I, think I, did I read to, that I'm yeah. not sure I'm not yeah. sure no it's just because I was just reading because uh, when you mentioned Eddie Kinsler on was just he, he did an interview with GA.ie and uh, I don't think he mentioned it, but like positively for, for you, Wally, for Leash fans, there was talk of like this current Leash generation being reminiscent of the golden generation, let's say, of the 90s. So harking back from when you yeah. won minors and stuff like that. So uh, We I, were hammering Dublin in Leinster yeah, finals. Yeah. Two Leinster medals I have underage level, we hammered Dublin after replays in both of them in Tullamore. Yeah. They haven't, uh, the, the, the lowest margin of victory uh, for them in the under 20 so far was nine points, I think, in the Leicester Dublin. for Dublin this ah, year. Look, uh, but, the, so but the fact that Leash. But the Leash, Leash have some good players on their team, the fact they've nine underage yeah. again, like, I mean, I think they'll definitely get closer than the 13 last last uh, last time. I think it's in Dr. Cullen Park as well, which, uh, um, well, I don't know who it'll suit. But anyways, that's it. Um, so best to look to Leash under 20s uh, we'll come back with <laughs> from <laughs> Willie <laughs> from, from everyone at the GAR <laughs> a couple of scary who was in the 2016 all Ireland final Mayo no it wasn't even it was Mayo it was Mayo it was Mayo in Dublin <laughs> alright we'll come back in part 2 All right, so there's only one game this weekend and it's Fermanagh taking on Armagh and former Fermanagh great Ryan McCluskey joins us on the line now Ryan how's it going? Not too bad at all, how are you? Good, good. How's retirement? You were 19 years on the go for Fermanagh, so like, I mean, I suppose this takes a bit, that took a bit of adjustment for you. Uh, I, you, you know, I, I actually seen, uh, it was Mike Tyson, the great Mike, Mike Tyson's uh, uh, little um, video there, sorry, it's, it's up online at the moment, of of him kind of talking about his past and and I, there were there were shades of me actually that, that could relate to that. You, you know, it, I probably found it very difficult. To, you probably would say the, the, the same yourself. You know, it, it was very regimented, obviously, for a number of years. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something, listen, that, that that I personally like. But you, you know, when you when you come into your latter years and you can't do the things that you done and maybe uh, put the tackles in, you know, against the likes of your, your, yourself and and uh, maybe maybe be an enforcer maybe at times. I think you were maybe a bit of an enforcer. You know, when you when you can't do any of that. And uh, your body's just not the the same as what it was. You, you know, I it 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 was tough, but you know, I didn't I suppose sit around too long. I I, I moved into management, I suppose, and, and moved into business then. So I suppose that's uh, plenty for for any man as well to keep them occupied. So I suppose that's that's filled the gap. But uh, no, listen, you, you you missed the playing, missed the playing side of things, and and you know would would take it all back in the morning there was, there was nothing like being out there and I'm sure you'll agree with that yeah yeah no definitely so you've opened up your own business it's called Focus and what is it it's it's a sports recovery um sports recovery center 
Yeah, well, we started we started off. I suppose it was I uh, two two years ago. Um, actually, I think to to today as well that uh, we started off as a, a small recovery unit, and and then I was fortunate to to get my local um, Gaelic club, obviously in the Skilling Gales, uh, to get them to help. Um, so we we attached the, the gym side of things onto the recovery unit, right. and then we we found a bigger premises then, and, and we moved in there. So it's it's been a busy couple of years, but I I'm, I'm delighted now with where where things have gone and. I managed to hook one of my, my friends in as well, Cahill Beacom. He, he's came on board. So the two of us are, are ploughing away despite uh, all the Brexit problems. We're, we're still alive and well at this stage. So things and are going all right. And do you go to Ricey then and you, do you try to sell it to Ricey and say, look, this is what you need. Who are you with now and whatever and get in, get the Fermanagh lads in there? Uh, listen, we, we, I suppose, seen a, a gap in the market at, at the start in terms of, you, you know, um, being a, a quite rural kind of part of, of uh, you could say the the country as well, and and from out here, you know, we would have had to do a lot of travelling to different parts of the country to use some of these services. So that was the reason why why we got them. But yeah, we we'd be on Racy's case and you know, the Fermanagh County Board and, and to be fair they've been very, very good and I'm gonna say the county board, listen, we've we've been grateful of the support of many clubs and, and sporting and persons I suppose in the area that come in and use our, our services and, and that's what we were trying to, to bring you know somewhere, somewhere along the lines we'd love it to be a kind of centre of excellence and, and have you know maybe even a, a doctor at some stage in as well or, or a sports specialist in, in that field you know but we're less and more slowly building and uh, we're happy with, with things and where they're going Yeah very good Well look Camille, I want to talk to you about Fermanagh because we, we haven't spoken about them too much on the show they're kind of flying under the radar um so far in the league, like the, the, it's a weird one. They probably should have beaten Kildare. A lot of people are saying they beat Ross Common in a game that could have gone either way. They did twelve wides against Cavan to Cavan's three and missed a load of goal chances. So should have beaten them, and you know had a poor enough performance by all accounts against Westmead. So where do you think they're at? Yeah. I, I think you've you've hit the nail on the head. You, you know, and any uh, I suppose any games that that I have been in attendance of and. And obviously they end up my, my homework on the, on the other games. I think that that inconsistency that you're only after kind of highlighting as well. That's probably been the most consistent part of of their campaign so far. Um, you know, creating chances in in most of the games, um, and just not capitalising as well. Um, has been a big kind of problem um, with with the side thus far this year as well. Um, in terms of coming under the the, the radar as well. Listen, there's been a number of changes. Um, to the playing squad throughout the, the last um, season or, or so as well and, and that probably has caused that bit of inconsistency but you know I suppose maybe this extra week will, will give the lads a, a chance to get back to the drawing board and, and try and right the wrongs from that Cavan game where, where they were hit by two or three it was two sorry cruel goals uh, two high balls in probably if, if anyone's seen the, the the pattern goal in, in the Dublin game, you know, you know, the one two, dissimilar to to that. So, right. so two high high balls in, you know, you know, were were pivotal and, and swung that game. But again, you know, you know, for me, for Manor with a better side that night and, and created more chances. I think they kicked thirteen, fourteen wides, and you alluded to to it at the start as well, Colin. That that it, it has been the same in in the rest of the games as well. Take out probably the, the West Mead game. Right. Okay. And like, I mean, the, 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 apparently there's a new style in Fermanagh. Has this been over overplayed? Like, uh, uh, Shane McGullion was talking during the week, and he was saying that a lot of us haven't played that way with Fermanagh over the last uh, while. So mistakes are going to happen. That's just the reality. But the more we play it, the more we practice, the mistakes will get ironed out, and hopefully we'll do the basics better. Armagh will probably be thinking we'll drop everyone. Uh, back like we usually did but if we push out and put pressure on them hopefully we'll get the turnovers high, higher up the field has that been a feature Is like are mistakes being made because it's a new style and they're not used to it um, I suppose listen there's, there's probably an argument for, for a number of points there um, with, with Shane and I know he really only came into the squad this year so I, I don't know where his his previous <laughs> thought process. Maybe maybe that was with the the club. And listen, you know he is a good lad and has done done very well this year as well. And and probably has been one of the the key finds actually for for the squad this year. He he has been fantastic for Derek Onley. But in terms of that kind of style and system, you know for me and and listen, I would know a lot of those lads very well. I'm only only out of that change room a couple of of years as well. Um, there hasn't been a massive change, you know. You know, despite you know we're very critical in in Tramana here at times when 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 things are when things are going well. You know, obviously a, a lot of people will jump on the bandwagon and be, I suppose, handshaking and, and backslapping, and, and obviously then when when things take a, a small turn for the worst, you know, we're very quick to to jump on the horse and point fingers and and criticise. You know, 
he, Rory in his backroom team and Ricey was was in that and, and key to it as, as well. You know, created a, I suppose a bit of a, a platform in terms of, you know, getting back to that level of, of maybe consistency and professionalism that I know I know it's that dreaded word maybe that, that uh, people don't like to hear it within GA circles, but you know, for a couple of years I know we done all right as well under under Pete McGrath, but things had, had fallen a wee bit, you know, by the wayside and, and standards I suppose had slipped. So when the boys come back in they, they you know you know, I suppose worked on, on a style of play and, and tried to build, I suppose, from, from the back up and I know there's a lot of criticism at, at the time and in terms of, of how we were playing and, and yes, I, I completely understand that it wasn't maybe the pleasing on the eye, eye to anyone coming in, you know, to watch the games, but I suppose listen, you know, we, we had certain tools and we, we had to use them to the best of, of our ability as well. And and I think what they've what they've done is is, is built on that as well. Yes, they they've created more more chances and they have been a bit more open in their play, but, you know, they, they still you know, you know, have tried to defend and, and defend, you know, as as much as they, they can and shut shut teams down and, and try and kind of counter attack and and uh, it it has listen it it has been good in, in the sense that they, they have created you know a number of, of scoring opportunities and and they should have capitalised on those but you know the the, the gaps at the back have, have have cost them as well you know and and it's about I suppose fine tuning that there is a lot of new faces and, and Shane is one of them and it's just kind of bleeding those lads getting them in and and he was right in saying you know getting them used to the system they're going to make a lot of mistakes but you know you know they, they need to learn and they need to learn fast because because you know at this stage from promotion you know contenders and thinking you know they might have a, a sniff at the start of the year they're now looking at relegation and obviously this this game against Armagh this weekend is massive yeah no exactly so like I mean I suppose the difference between the Rory Gallagher era maybe with Ricey this year is that maybe they're not turning around and running back waiting you know they're 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 maybe pressing a little bit up and they're sometimes they're a bit like Dublin or Kerry or any of the big teams if you're slow with your build up they'll have lads back but that's not where you know they're not heading back waiting like they used to well, I, I suppose, listen, I, I kind of have certain insights and, and obviously, yeah, I, you know, uh, I'm not going to give anyone from Armagh here any insight into in <laughs> where, where they're at. But um, no, listen, they, they, they seem to, yeah, have, have maybe certain episodes or, or patterns in their play where, where they will, um, yeah, try, try and close close the opposition down and, and uh yeah, maybe maybe there's not as many getting back, but but certainly, yeah, they, they do try and kind of... Um, keep it as compact as they can, certainly down the middle and, and try and close up the opposition in, in that sense. And really as 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 we said, you know, it, it has just been that 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 lack of firepower up front that, that has been critical and, and, and has cost them you know dearly. And, you know, if you look at it's it's so nearly I suppose a case this year in terms of they've nearly beaten these sides and they've they've, you know, nearly kind of pushed on in these games and I can only look back to, to last year, you know, they, they nearly got out of actually division two and went up to one, you know, yeah. I think a point would have secured them in Arma um that night on, on you know, against Arma and a point against me would have possibly even done it, depending on, on the results the last day. But, you know, division two is, is just war warfare this year and as much as we're we're now sitting and we're looking at this game at the weekend with Fermana where they are and obviously Arma where they are, the whole thing could swing and you know, Fermana beat Ross Common a few weeks ago, you know, there would be nothing that would surprise me more that in, in you know, two, three weekends time when when the, the league campaign is, is at a, its conclusion that Fermana you know, could be sitting there, they're about at the top and Roscommon could be near the, the bottom. So the, the league has just been madness in Division 2 and, and if, if there is a headline for Division 2, it would be that inconsistency for everyone because everyone can, can beat anybody on their given day and, you, you know, it's it's probably the same with Armagh, you know. Yeah, no, exactly. It's it's the most evenly matched division from top to bottom. There's no, you know, like yeah. for Mana versus Armagh, you're wondering, like, who could win this one and that's top versus bottom almost, you know, like, I mean, so yeah, it is yeah, the closest yeah. uh, in the Division one, there's a gap between the top and the bottom. Division three, there's yeah. a gap between the top and bottom. There's not that in two. Ryan Jones, who's been talking about a new role, he said, Ricey has played me in a couple of different positions and I feel one of my responsibilities is to get scores on the board as much as possible. Are we see? I think he scored six points in the first three games. Are we seeing him get forward more and, you know, given more of a role um, not to have to defend as much? Uh, I, I would say I would listen with, with Ryan and he, he has been one of the... the Better players for for Fermanagh, um, certainly this season, um, and he he has contributed, you know, you know, from a scoring perspective a bit more this year. Uh, he has been one of the dominant figures, I would have said, over the last number of years, you, you know, and and even with this club, listen, he's been at, at the forefront of 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 their campaigns in in Fermanagh and obviously Ulster and and 
and, and been one of the key figures over the last number of years. You know, him adding the, that game I has has certainly you know pushed him on to another level. And, and listen, he 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 will need it at the weekend as well. You know, and, and it'd be brilliant. Listen, if if himself and 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 O'Connell listen. Garvin, there's there's three Jones brothers in there. If the three lads can can just reca- uh, recapture that form they they've had with with Derek Onley and and you know come to the fore at the weekend because you know when when one's playing well usually as well you know they're, they're all kind of you know adding their, their two pence as well so it'd be brilliant. Listen if if he could add more scores at the weekend and and obviously try and, and get that massive win for Fermanagh. Right. One thing I wanted to ask you about was the Rory. You obviously played under Rory Gallagher, and you yeah. were you were there when you know the pretty defensive system, and you got to the Ulster final. And like Rory Gallagher was always the one to say, "Look, this is the system that suits the players we have." And like I used to make the point on the show, is it really though? Like I mean, is that kind of putting Fermanagh into a into a Division Four kind of category when they have very good footballers? And if you had the two Quigleys and you know Tomas Corrigan, for example, you'd be well able to play a different style of football. How did you sit? How did that sit with you by saying this is the only way that these lads are able to you know play? Or would that have ever even crossed your mind? You were doing well with the system; it didn't it didn't bother you. Um. I, I, I think, listen, you, you know, we, we under Rory, yes, Rory came in and, and knew there were, we, listen, we were shipping far too many scores. If you go back to that, that Pete McGrath era, as much as we, we were maybe scoring and, and it was looking maybe pleasing on, on one side of the fence, you, you know, when you looked at it defensively, we were shipping far too many scores and, and you know, that had caused, a, a, I suppose, a... Um, relegation, I suppose, as well. You, you know, under Pete, possibly even two. I'm not sure in, in that campaign with with uh, when Pete McGrath was in. But you know, you know, we we were very inconsistent from a defensive point of view, um, in that sense. So I know he came in, and that was one of the, the first things he was looking to address. In terms of then the firepower, uh, yes, we we certainly had uh, players with fire, firepower as well. You know, I suppose you could say then that that. At, at, at times we, we we were hit with maybe some injuries as well which which didn't help and and ah uh, he 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 certainly listen you, you know I suppose pe- people will have will have their own opinions on the whole thing he has taught I know m- myself and that current group of players a lot in terms of football knowledge and, and seeing the game from from a different side of of things he was an integral part obviously to that Donegal side and and however people may have liked or not liked their style of play you know it was very successful for for, for them as well um he does a bit of work I know with with I know he's with Derry you know he does a bit of work I think in Killy Beggs possibly as well and I think he has a has a massed amount of, of, of attacking talent down there and they play a completely different style. So, you know, we listen, you know, Rory came in and, and him and the backroom team felt that defensively we, we could be stronger and build from there. And, you know, I, I know we didn't win too many games by 10, 15, 16 points, but from a player player's point of view, listen, the players were were, were happy, you know, to, to get to the Ulster final that day, although, you know, we, we didn't give a, a, a good account of ourselves, you know, to get there and, and to ha- have that promotion campaign and, and possibly even get up you know the players were happy and it brought brought us on to the next level and and uh, you you know it it definitely stabilized you know where we were we were as a county and people say about you know us punching above our of our weight you know above our weight sorry and, and stuff like that and, and that used to i suppose irritate us and the fact that we we trained as hard as anybody else we were out working as hard as everybody else and we we're putting in the same you, you know shifts and hours and, and commitments as, as every everybody else and i suppose the way we've seen it you know like anything else you know why why couldn't we be the, those Sheffield United's or, or Bournemouth, Bournemouth, sorry, or, or Everton's maybe in in your case here, you know, where we could, yeah, uh, you know, you know, maybe upset the the top echelon of 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 teams, you know, within within the GA or or, you know, I was talking about soccer terms there, but you know, we might not be winning well, or your Athletic one Madrid, we, we were maybe winning and ugly, but ultimately we we were getting an extended summer and we had some brilliant days, so. You know, ultimately, you know, <laughs> you go back to if you want to play well and get knocked out every week in the first or second week, and it wasn't the case. And you know, you, you could ask those players, you could ask those players who, who you, you referred to as well, and and those lads all bought into it. And you know, you know, it, it obviously brought us all on. It wasn't too pleasing to watch, but but listen, it it was successful to to where we we wanted to go and has has created that platform now for Fermanagh to, to push on as well. Yeah, it probably extended your career by a few years as well because you didn't have you don't, you know you, you had plenty of lads back to help you because when you wh- when I was playing you used to be Fermanagh's man marker and then you kind of 
mm-hmm. you, you know, you were more or less uh, a, a, a kind of one, of, maybe one of the zonal players organising the defence a little yeah. bit. And I, I remember marking you. It was never a, a, an easy experience marking you. And then, of course, I went to Boston one year and I was kicking around before the game. And I look up the other end of the field and who's up uh, signed up for the Macanespies? You. I went, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and, then, and then I couldn't believe my luck. You went over and marked Dennis Glennon. It was brilliant. <laughs> I <laughs> listen. It was a uh, it was good times now, but I it, it it just shows you how the, the game has completely you know changed and and transformed. And and you're right. I, th- I think listen in my, in my my latter years, the, the role that became more of a maybe organisational role, and in terms of you know, there wouldn't have been that that I called it that kamikaze marking, and and I would refer to this if you were coaching down to the lads in Burr, and I always go back to you know the days. I'm not 90 by the way either, but I always go back to those days when. You know, you refer to Lexi yourself or the, the Glennons or it could have been Canavans or God knows who it was where it was just a big open bit of green grass and yeah. you had maybe yourself and, and myself, sorry, and yourself, Colm, or, or myself and Stephen McDonald and you're just sitting praying for somebody to come back and be in front of you and close things down and, and uh, try and help you out because you were usually up against a greyhound and you're sitting going, right, I need to be Mike Tyson here, you know, and I need to try and enforce my, my presence on them and, and try and kind of shut them down physically or in, in some way. But uh, now they listen, listen um, you know, the game has, has changed, you know, you know, and evolved so much over, over the years. And, and uh, I suppose, yeah, it was, it was trying to re- reinvent myself over the last number of years and trying to kind of play as long as I could. And, and obviously, then, you know, I, I was grateful listening any time I put on that, that green jersey of, of whatever management team was in there and, and hopefully give it, give it my best. But uh, I think, yeah, the, the the system now probably suits me, suited me more. And if you ask any defender, I think it, it suits any defender these days, you know. But uh, gone are those those days of the one v ones, you know. Yeah. It was, so when it was you're pandemonium. So, yeah. So when you're coaching the coaching players now, do you coach them in the same way you would have been coached? Because those one on ones aren't really there. Do you just always tell them to stay goal side? Someone will come and help you, you know, rather than try and get out in front, for example, which is more high risk. No, it's good. It's a good question. I suppose there there is a balance. There would have to be a balance of of, of both. You, you know, defenders have to be able because at some stage in the game there there is a a likelihood and a high possibility that they will be left in a, maybe a one on one situation or a two on two, whatever it is, and they have to be accountable for their man. But you know, th- there is certainly less scenarios of that in the modern game. So you are kind of trying to to look at um you you know backing players up and. As I said, from a defender's point of view, and when I was standing beside beside yourself or a or a Dennis Glennon, um, whoever it may have been, and you were sitting going, you hoping and praying the ball didn't come in, come in. You were, you were just hoping that somebody would be back to maybe deal with that breaking ball. So a lot of the times, yeah, you're looking at scenarios like that in the modern game where you, you know you're looking at defenders, um, maybe not looking for fetching clean ball to, to work on breaking balls so that you have maybe players coming in and scooping that ball up and, and uh, getting possession and, and kind of building from, from there but you, you know that's I suppose moving with the, the modern game and trying to evolve with, with the modern kind of style of play as well Yeah come here before I let you go do you think Fermanagh will be able to do it against Armada obviously we all rave about about Armada's forward line which is a, like as good as anyone in the country their midfield's very good you could potentially get some joy off their defence so I suppose that's the way you might be looking at it. I, I've just I've seen I've seen them a number of times. Listen, and played against them over the last number of seasons. We we I don't know what the actual record is or the amount of times we played them, but but I know it's it's over the last maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten seasons. We we definitely have played them six, seven, possibly eight times as well. We we just seem to be on a collision course every year as well. Whether with them, but um, I, I, I don't know if they're quite inconsistent as well they're still hard to work out yeah. you know under Kieran as well in terms of the the last night I watched them sorry was, was against Kildare and, and they were you know exceptional that night I, I was actually thinking to myself that night that, and I, I went on record and saying that you know they have to be contenders for Division 2 and will probably cause a few upsets in, in Ulster this summer and maybe, maybe give it a rattle but um, there's an impatient side of their, their game as well where um, against Kildare it probably suited them the conditions the night, uh, they, they couldn't because of the, the environment around them. They couldn't kick the ball that night because it was all over the place. It was a really bad night for football. It suits them actually carrying the ball. Um, and, and on you know the rest of their league form, and any time then I've seen clips, clips of them and highlights of them, they, they seem to have this impatient side of the, the, their game where they're looking to, to 
go through the transitions quite quickly through feet and you know you know yourself this time of year the environment as well and the conditions don't just lend well at times to 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 that maybe one bounce in front of the forward you, you know ball that, that everyone would would love yeah. it's just horrible conditions at the minute and i think they're probably better running the ball and it's that impatient kind of play at times where they're hurried and, and looking to get the ball in nice and quick to to some brilliant forwards as well i think that that has been you know the, the impulsive and careless side for them that that has cost them then because it's teams a, yeah, can, can it's a strength, get, get at that back. Yeah, it's a strength and a weakness nearly. Yeah, yeah, it is, and then teams have, have kind of counterattacked them and caught them on the break and and, and caught them then defensively. Um, you know because of just just maybe bad decision making and and those we careless kind of phases in their play. But listen, they they have. All the tools and and you know obviously I'm putting my, putting my from a hat on as well you, you know I I think at uh, at home you know we're we're a force to be reckoned with although I know Calvin breached us the, the, the last day but I'm I'm thoroughly hoping and expecting for a from win win um, on Saturday evening. Brilliant stuff, Ryan. Thanks very much for taking the call. No problem at all. Good man. Thank you. Yeah, great stuff from Ryan um, there, lads. So it's hard, like Ryan reckons the home advantage is going to swing it for Fermanagh. I wouldn't be surprised who wins this either way because, as we know, like I was saying to Ryan, there's just such a little gap from the very top to the very bottom in Division 2. It's the closest division right right the way through. And Fermanagh might be in a bit of a false position based on the fact that they threw the Cavan game away and could have beaten Kildare. Do you know? So, like, I mean, things can change very, very quickly. The whole idea about the the new Fermanagh, the new attacking Fermanagh, which Ryan is, is kind of playing down, I think maybe there's the truth is somewhere in between here, right? So, like, they're obviously not as defensive as they were under Rory Gallagher, but the idea that they're playing like Galway might be a little... <laughs> a little <laughs> but, again, the way to play against uh, Fermanagh, Ryan makes a very good point in the fact that sometimes our mag get a bit impatient and they can be a bit loose with their kick-passing game yeah. and a couple of sweepers tactically makes sense against... One sweeper makes sense against... Uh, against Armagh even if it's just your centre back covering back cutting out that initial kick pass that they like yeah but I see for Mana their highest score in game they got 14 points and 111 in the last game you know so yeah. again like it was worse last year in the last two years definitely but um, they were undone against Cavan by two just high balls into the area one of them Faulkner just came up from fullback no one picked them up so it's one of those cases when you have all those bodies back you know so somebody doesn't pick up one person who's completely free and I was just wondering, that was two goals in five minutes from high balls. Like, Armagh have better clientele just to drop in around the square. Better ball players if they kick the ball in. Would they be licking their lips thinking about that? Even with all those bodies back, it could yeah. be a way through. Yeah, but that, okay, that was a one-off game. I wouldn't say for Mana have a clear weakness in their full back line for high ball. You know what I mean? I'm not sure Che Cullen's a solid full back. Like, I don't yeah. think that's a, that's not an ongoing issue for them. Do you know? And I, I think if Armagh go down, Armagh play a different game than... than hopping it in onto the edge of the square do you know what I mean I don't know if that's necessarily a weakness or what or What it, I do think definitely that if you stop Armagh's kicking game or if you maybe tempt them into it but have a covering player you know you can get a lot of turnovers with Armagh because like, obviously we know kick passing is a lot higher risk than moving it through the hands yeah and I'll say they'll cut their cloth for Mana this weekend to suit because I'm just looking back at um, like when Armagh played I think it was Westmead last time out and just the, the forward line they had like Rory Grugan got 1-4 Reno O'Neill I think it was all from freeze with Jarl Hoke Burns Connor Turbot who was showing really well earlier on um, so I think with that in mind as kind of Ryan hinted at and Jamie Clark came on and scored Jamie, the equalising Jamie goal Jamie Clark came on and scored a goal as well so like as I think it was Jim McCarry was hinting at a couple of weeks ago that like whatever talk is coming out about Fermanagh about a more expansive style uh, you know it mightn't necessarily bear fruit against Amar this weekend which I think Ryan McCluskey was hinting at because But you have to be careful though because if you head back and wait for them <clears> you'll turn them off kicking altogether Do you get me? And then it'll be one of these games of chess and the better players will probably win out in that scenario. Yeah. You almost want to tempt Armagh into taking those risks for the kick passing. Do you get me? Because it is more high risk and have your half-back line tempting them into it, but dropping off, you know what I mean? Dropping off, they're meant to cut it out. Yeah, so with just one sweeper. Would it have to be a very, a very clever sweeper there, you know, just to, to kind of cover the ground properly? Because if, if, he, if he doesn't, then like Armagh have the forwards to kind of do damage against that like. Yeah, no, it is. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how they go about it. But like, you know, I suppose... 
you don't want our man not to kick past too much because that's you will get cheap turnovers against our man just through their their impatience with using the kick pass. Yeah, it is a fine line, but like if you're you sort of don't want them to kick pass either. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't yeah. want them to have that game. And here's the thing that our man don't have that the likes of Galway have is a consistent target man up front. Rian O'Neill is brilliant, but he's not out in front all the time. Like he's not going to give you that obvious ball that Shane Walsh will give you all the time. Jamie Clark doesn't play like that either. He's pure class. You know, they, I think when you're playing a kicking game, you need an Andy Moran or a Shane Walsh or someone who's just constantly moving. And when you look up, that's on. Because when you look on up and it's not on, you, you have to go backwards or sideways because you're under enough pressure. How many times have you come up, your butt kind of come up through the wing back position and you're very tempted to say, will you come on? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's a real weaselly thing to do. But sometimes you can get frustrated because nothing's on. You want to, you want to see something easy. And you turn back. Yeah. And yeah. then you turn back because or else you, you give a 50-50 one because I've often done it. And I know it's not the right ball, but it's like either I give this now or I'm going to get caught. And you give it in. And it's a 50-50 and it's punched out and it comes back out. Mayo, Mayo are suffering for that so badly in this year's oh, league badly. because not only Andy Moore and Jason Doherty isn't there as the link man on the 40 and because Aidan O'Shea has had to be played in midfield there's no physicality up there as well but Andy particularly because Mayo's, Mayo have thrived in the last few years on those balls that Andy has been out in front and, and yeah. is winning all the time in good positions as opposed to a few years earlier he used to be winning them you know maybe on the 20 yard line out, out on the sideline and then he kind of mentioned how Tony McEntee had a word with him to stop going out there and then he was winning them in better positions yeah, uh, I get. I got what you're saying about uh, Rian O'Neill as well. I just wonder. I see Jarlath Oak Burns has been. Has he been kind of? We haven't seen too much of Arma. Has he been kind of going out the middle? They've been using him as a tactic for an advance mark. He's playing at midfield. He's pretty much, he came on against Leash in midfield. Anyways, that's the the game I saw. I saw him in. I think he's playing in midfield, but he is an attacking midfielder. Yeah, he's getting yeah. on. But that that's the thing. And the one thing about Andy Moran is. Stephen Rutcher's tenure with Mayo was going terribly until Andy Moran came on started with well, start against Kildare in a in a qualifier they'd been beaten by Galway yeah. they hadn't been playing well in the league could mm. have been relegated and Andy Moran gave them that focal point I do think if you want a kicking game you have to have a focal point and the brilliant thing about Galway changing Comer and Walsh is that Walsh it's impossible to get out in front of Walsh he's just so fast and he's constantly there as that Focal point. And mm. without the focal point, what's your kicking game then? Mm. It has to be perfect. Do you know? You have to get it into the perfect position to give the perfect diagonal ball. Whereas Galway don't really have to do that. You know, Galway, Shane Walsh will often break out and collect it around the 40, take on his man, or else throw it off, and now someone's broken the line past him. Do you know what I mean? I, th- I think that teams that want to play a kicking game need to find, mm. need to find a, a suitable target man it doesn't have to be a tall man it needs to be a live wire and Galway haven't even played Ian Burke yet in this year's league as well just, who just, be constantly uh, you know, moving and then if yeah. not working for Shane Wells throw Damian Comer in there at 14 as a focal point so um, we're so bringing it back to Galway again <laughs> lads aren't we <laughs> and, and, and you it all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay predictions here and what do you think Connor go, uh, oh, for man his need is greater just maybe because of that I might tip them to just get over the line they, as you said they haven't been playing that badly and, and the, their their position in the league might be a little bit false so I'll just go for them to get over the line I go Arma the only team they lost to is Leash and sure they always lose to Leash and always <laughs> lose to Leash yeah weirdly I'm going to go for a draw I think, it, I think it could be close and I don't trust Arma yet I take your point and Brewster Park is a terrible place um, to go so I'll go for a draw completely sitting the fence right that's it lads um, we'll be back I'm not sure we'll do a show on Monday unless there's some sort of World War 3 happens in this or maybe Leash Windy Under 20 we might do a, <laughs> might do a special two shows <laughs> we'll definitely be back next uh, next Thursday we'll, we'll see about Monday we'll talk to you then good luck Thank you.